here to share about Literacy Connect's um, English Language Acquisition for Adults program and about the role of volunteer programs in the larger TESOL context, as well as ways that we can all advocate for our students in this upcoming midterm election. I am very lucky because I've never had a doubt about what I wanted to do in my career. I've always known that I wanted to be a teacher. I got my bachelor's degree in secondary social studies um, at the University of Missouri. And then I decided that if I was going to be teaching high schoolers about the world, I ought to go out and experience some of it. So I joined the Peace Corps and I taught English as a foreign language to junior high students in Chad from 2004 to 2006 and in Mauritania from 2006 to 2007. And I taught in a variety of settings. I taught in a reed classroom. I taught in a mud classroom. I taught in, finally, a cement classroom. Um, and as a 22-year-old in my first teaching job, I had a lot of ups and downs. I had a lot of successes, but mostly failures. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I took away from that experience was the, the feeling of what it's like to be an adult language learner in a new country and a new culture where I was not literate in the local language. And so that sparked my interest in language acquisition. And so when I returned to the States, I came to the U of A to do my master's in language reading and culture with an emphasis in educating English language learners. And when I came out of grad school, I, um, I taught as an adjunct at Pima Community College before joining the Center for English as a Second Language um, in the intensive English program and teacher training program and several other programs for about six years. And I grew a lot in my time at Cecil. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I had there. And I learned so much from my great colleagues. But my heart was always in community, um, community programs and social justice. And so when a Literacy Connects volunteer, who's also a grad student in the English and Applied Linguistics program, who's actually here today, Nancy Kuo, she presented today. She told me about Literacy Connects, and um, so I joined Literacy Connects as a volunteer, not teaching classes, but doing um, continuing education workshops for their volunteers. And so when the teacher training coordinator position opened, I jumped at the chance to unite my passion and my career, um, and I joined Literacy Connects as a staff member. So what is Literacy Connects? Literacy Connects is a nonprofit organization in Tucson that offers literacy and creative expression programming for learners of all ages. Our programming is all student-centered. Um, we hope to help learners find their voices um, and develop the tools and skills that they need to meet their own uh, goals and uh, achieve their own dreams. We believe that everyone can be a lifelong learner. I'm not going to talk about the other programs. I'm, I'm going to focus on my program. But if you're interested in learning about our other programs, you can go to literacyconnects.org. And also, if by the end of the presentation, I've convinced you that you want to volunteer with us, literacyconnects.org is your first stop for that as well. So our ELLA program offers free English as a second language classes uh, to adult immigrants and refugees throughout Tucson and southern Arizona. We offer classes in 21 sites, including schools and libraries and churches. We offer 41 classes of all different uh, days and times. We serve 1,600 students uh, pretty much every year. And um, those students come from 75 countries and speak 29 different languages. So we have um, a lot of diversity in our classes. Literacy Connect's goal with all of its programs is to serve students who aren't able to access services elsewhere. We uh, prioritize lower, lowering barriers for our students. So our classes are free to the students, and we're able to do that because they are taught by our incredibly dedicated volunteers. Uh, they are open enrollment, meaning that st students can join the class at almost any point during the year. We have no attendance requirements because we know that our students, like us, are very busy, busy people with very complicated lives. Maybe they are caring for family members at home or ha, um, rely on public transportation or have jobs with complicated schedules. So um, when they are able to come to class, we welcome them, but there are no consequences if they are not able to come to class. 
Um, and so we see our students step in and step out of our classes, but you see them return year after year and make progress um, as they attend classes. Um, we offer a variety of times and locations, and we don't do any standardized testing or um, check any immigration documentation because we left state funding in 2007. Um, the required standardized testing was very difficult for us as a volunteer organization because to ask volunteers to administer standardized tests is not a very fulfilling experience for the volunteers. Um, and um, in 2007, when the state legislature passed a law that anyone receiving state funding had to check immigration documentation, um, that was sort of the last straw for us, and we left state funding. But the community really stepped up and supported us for that. We now, um, our budget is about half individual donations, and the other half is from grants and fee-for-service agreements with various local entities. Um, and then we work hard to to make sure that our classes are a safe space for students to practice the English that they want to know, that they need for their lives. Many students say that this is the one place, Ella class is the one place where I can relax and practice without feeling embarrassed or ashamed about my English. And so our classes are important not only because of the English that our students are acquiring, but because of them being able to develop the, the comfort and the confidence necessary to survive and thrive and contribute to our communities. So I'd like to introduce you to a couple of our students. This is Adol. Adol came to Tucson as a refugee from South Sudan in 2006. She arrived with six children and no English. And she was able to get a job as a housekeeper at a, a resort in Tucson. But she struggled because she couldn't communicate questions or concerns because no one spoke her first language and she didn't speak any English. But that all began to change when her daughter learned about the free English classes at Santa Rosa Library in Tucson, our Ella classes. Um, and so Adol immediately registered and she attended regularly for four years. We don't have any set curriculum in our Ella classes, but Rather, um, our tutors survey the, the students about what they are interested in practicing. Common topics include talking to um, their, their kids' teachers or schools, talking to the doctor, and in the case of Adol's class, workplace English. And so Adol, um, when, we, when we asked her how English helped her at work, she said that it gave her freedom. She can now stand up for herself at work, she can advocate for her children, and she can help others. Adol got her citizenship in 2014. Yeah. And when we asked her what that meant to her, what US citizenship meant to her, she said, again, it means that I'm free. Free to vote and free to help. Adol's family is doing great. She now has, her youngest is in middle school. She has two kids in high school. She has two that are studying at Pima Community College, and she has one that is attending university out of state. And the family recently moved into their own Habitat for Humanity home. So they are doing great. Another student I'd like to introduce you to is Victoria Juanita Zadroga. She is from the village in Mexico where the monarch butterflies end their migration. Yeah. Um, and she is quite a fighter. As a young woman in her community, she started a nonprofit to help local women start small businesses to become uh, self-sufficient. But after receiving threats from local officials, she had to flee to the States. And she recalls feeling this incredible sense of loss when she arrived in the States. She, like, she had lost her family, her language, her culture, her life's work, everything. She began attending beginner Ella class at Sacred Heart Church, one of our sites, and um, was a very dedicated student. At times, she attended three of our different classes all over town so that she could stack her schedule. And she made really rapid progress. She moved up to the intermediate level and decided that she wanted to give back. And so she became an Ella tutor and worked as an assistant teacher in the beginning class that she had come out of. Here she is giving a speech at, uh, 
for our Women Rise program, which is uh, for women refugee and immigrants who are seeking employment. So she was sharing her experiences and making us all cry, basically, because she's so awesome. Um, and she is also doing great. She has gotten her translator certificate from Pima Community College and just completed a triple major at the U of A in Latin American Studies, Public Health, and Psychology. Yeah, yeah. And she's now working as a health promoter. So here are some other things our students have had to say. Um, I became able to say something at stores, restaurants, and the hospital. I can make an appointment, I can understand. I have more confidence to ask questions. I joined a job search success program. I spoke English at the library to get help and get my library card. I read children's stories with my son every day and we learn new words together. And finally, I, learned, I used English to get my citizenship. We are so proud of our students and they succeed because of their hard work and determination and incredible sacrifices. And the access to English helps them develop the tools that they need to, to, to um, greet those, uh, make those achievements. But without access to English, those achievements would have been sharply curtailed and our community would have been the poorer for it. So let's look at where our classes fall in the larger landscape of um, ESL providers in Tucson. Um, so uh, we, these are the major uh, ESL providers for adults. And here we're looking at cost, teachers, uh, attendance requirements, curriculum requirements, immigration requirements, and number of locations. So thinking about this in terms of access, our students, a number of our students do attend classes in these other locations. So none of these are mutually exclusive. Um, so Literacy Connects, they're free, taught by volunteer teachers. We don't have to check immigration documentation, et cetera. Next, we have the Refugee Education Program, um, which is part of Pima Community College's Adult Basic Education for College and Career. And this program is specifically for refugees within five years of arrival. And it offers uh, classes, free classes, um, from literacy level up to intermediate. Um, they are taught by professional teachers. Um, next, we have Pima Community College's ELLA classes, which are also free, um, taught by professional teachers. However, because Pima is state-funded, students must have immigration documentation to be able to attend. Um, but the, the ELLA classes are um, not graded, so students can take the classes as many times as they like before they feel ready to move on. Next, we have Pima's ESL classes. Um, these also require immigration documentation, and there is a cost associated. It's $80 per credit hour for residents and about $300 per credit hour for non-residents. And so these classes are a bit different because they are happening on Pima Community College's campus. So um, students who want a more academic experience would choose these classes. And um, at the higher levels of those classes, uh, the students are mostly academically bound, um, planning to move up into those um, credit-bearing Pima classes. And then finally, we have the University of Arizona's Intensive English program, where I spent six happy years. Um, and that costs uh, $3,000 per eight-week intensive session. And those are mostly academically bound international students. Students attend class about five hours per day, five days a week. So they are preparing to enter, to go straight into undergraduate or master's programs. So we hope that our Literacy Connects ELLA classes can be a complement to these other service providers. And we hope that we can provide access to English for those who aren't able to access these other um, institutions. So what are Literacy Connects classes like? We have three levels, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. So when I think about the Cecil IEP, we had seven levels. And those were, you know, each class was still very multi-level. So when you collapse those down into three levels, you can imagine the range of proficiencies within each class. Um, we also have students who have had a wide range of, exper of um, experience with the formal education system. Our classes do include uh, students who are 
L2 emergent readers, meaning that they are learning to interact with print literacy for the first time as they are acquiring English. We have students who have completed school up to elementary level, up to secondary level, and students with advanced degrees in their home countries. And they are all in class together. So that adds another layer of complexity in terms of uh, levels of proficiency and levels of um, that academic skill set. And so lesson planning for this incredibly diverse um, student population is really a challenge for our volunteer tutors. Um, I, we have a lending library of lesson planning resources and an online um, a web page of resources and I'm always available for coaching but um, this is just incredibly challenging for our volunteer teachers. So I do not do this alone. We are a team of four. Here we are. <laughs> we are two full-time and two part-time staff members at Literacy Connects. So that makes up three full-time equivalent positions. We serve 1,600 students annually because of our 80 volunteers. We simply could not do what we do without our incredibly passionate, dedicated volunteers. Our tutors gave 19,000 hours of their time in the last fiscal year. They, um, if, we, if we use a rate of $18 an hour, that works out to a $277,000 contribution to the community um, and helped us serve those 1,600 students. But those 1,600 students represent a tiny fraction of the need in Pima County. According to the Arizona Department of Education in 2017, there were 28,000 linguistically isolated households in Pima County. And they define linguistically isolated household as um, everyone in the household over the age of 14 has some difficulty with English. So 1,600 students, yay, pat on the back, but um, it, it's just a small fraction of the need. So where do volunteer programs fit in the larger TESOL community? Um, so the research shows that community adult English language learners have less access to institutional resources when compared with, e with um, ELLs in the K-12 system or at the university level. And so um, part of that is that community programs, because of funding, uh, offer, are only able to offer low pay to uh, the, our adult education personnel, which leads to high turnover, which means that community ESL programs often rely on volunteer tutors and teachers. And so the highest need students, these adult English language learners and L2 emergent readers, the highest need students are being served by lower skilled volunteer teachers rather than by expert teachers with the training necessary to really support, give these students the support they need. Um, and so, uh, Jenna, Alter Flores, Lisa Fogel, Amanda Snell, and I have a paper coming out about this, um, as well as a training we developed in response. And we like to think that we are um, making up for the dearth of literature about community ESL programs with the length of our citation. <laughs> Look at that. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> so what kind of training do our tutors receive? Um, in my role as the uh, tutor training is it tutor education and training coordinator. I'm responsible for initial foundations training for new tutors and continuing education support for ongoing tutors. Our foundations training um, consists of 12 hours of uh, adult learning theory, best practices in communicative language teaching, and um, cultural competence. And that's spread out over a three to six month apprenticeship with an experienced Ella volunteer, Ella tutor. And then at the end of that apprenticeship, our tutors, uh, the trainees can step up to become a lead tutor or a co-tutor. And then um, for continuing education support, uh, this is very, very challenging, keeps me on my toes, because it involves distilling my, my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and my 10 years of teaching experience, most, most of which happened in very academic contexts down into forms that are accessible and interesting and practical for volunteer tutors without teaching background. 
So um, I have a monthly newsletter where I, again, I try to distill second language acquisition theory into five minute YouTube videos. Um, I have a tutor learning community, which is our take on a professional learning community, which is a research-based, uh, research-backed approach to professional development in which participants uh, with similar interests come together to read articles and um, problem solve and reflect. Uh, we do mini conferences. This photo is from our Super Saturday uh, conference, which we put on for all of our Literacy Connects volunteers, as well as any community members who teach language and literacy. And I chose this photo because it has Nancy in it, who's the one who first introduced me to Literacy Connects. And this is Shirley, Shirley Griggs, who is 87 years old and has been volunteering with us for nine years. She still teaches a class that includes L2 emergent readers. And she is, she, she has come to AZT Sol, you know, five or six times. She's presented three or four times. She's had articles published in the AZT Sol uh, newsletter. And so uh, I, I gave her, she couldn't come today because she's recovering from dental surgery. Um, but I called her to tell her that I was gonna brag about her and she thought that was pretty cool. And actually she kept calling me back to tell me more things that she had done. <laughs> So, <laughs> that's Shirley. Um, incredibly dedicated volunteers. Um, workshops, sometimes I lead the workshops, but I've also, um, several former Cecil colleagues have come in to, uh, to volunteer their time and share their expertise with my tutors on topics like pronunciation and using music in the classroom, reading, things like that. And then finally, um, individualized coaching. And so, keep in mind that that these are volunteers who are already giving an average of seven hours per week, traveling to, planning for, and teaching their classes. And they still participated in 445 hours of continuing education last year. And so to me, that shows not only their incredible dedication, but also their understanding that not just anyone can teach English, that it really takes a lot of training and continuing education to be able to work um, in this field. So, do volunteer organizations contribute to the deprofessionalization of the TESOL field? I would argue that it is not the existence of volunteer organizations, but rather a lack of funding. Pro Literacy is um, an organization made up of 1,000 adult education member organizations. Um, and every year they release statistics about their members. In last year, 2017, 96% of instructors in those 1,000 organizations were volunteers. 96% uh, were volunteers. And so, Across the country, cuts to adult basic education funding have resulted in um, adult basic education professionals not being able to make a living wage and working multiple jobs to make ends meet. Adult basic education professionals are often unable to pursue um, additional credentialing or professional development because they can't afford it, and the programs that they work for cannot afford to pay them to go. So, when we have an education system that is adequately funded at the state and national level, the need for volunteer organizations will lessen. But until then, volunteer organizations will continue to serve the thousands and thousands of students who need access to English and, and basic education services that can't be served by other institutions. Which brings me to the last third of my talk. Um, Literacy Connects is an organization that works to fill in the gaps created by that lack of education funding. We take our role as an advo as advocacy organization seriously because we see that many of the challenges that our students face are a direct result of having fallen through the cracks of the education system. And so we are proud to stand up and speak out about the need for a fully funded education system. And so this photo, for those of you who um, weren't in Arizona this May, is from when Arizona teachers, public school teachers, walked out. 
uh, to protest the lack of education funding. This photo is from the first day of the walkout when 75,000 teachers, educators, support personnel, parents and supporters came to Phoenix, came to the state capitol to make their voices heard uh, to protest the lack of education funding. And I would like to pro uh, preface this part of the conversation with this photo, which is my current Facebook profile picture. This is from a rally on the day after the Invest in Education initiative was thrown off of the ballot. And just to be clear, I am crazy liberal. So this woman and I are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. But we were at the same rally, literally standing side by side, to fight for education funding that works for all Arizona students. So a little bit of history. When teachers walked out, they had five demands. They wanted a 20% raise for teaching and certified staff, competitive wages for classified staff, returning school funding to 2008 levels, which, by the way, in 2008, Arizona was 47th in the nation for per-pupil funding. Yeah, so we're trying to get back to that. <laughs> um, and demanded no new tax cuts until we reached the national average and yearly raises until teacher salaries reach the national average. And so, um, getting back to 2008, $1.1 billion have been cut from the Arizona public education system since 2008. And um, so, this is the, the governor's offers that happened earlier in the year, along with the Prop 123 money. This is money from the budget that was signed at the end of the teacher walkout. But you can see that about 60% of that money was, was still missing. And so the Invest in Education initiative was developed uh, to generate that money. It would have generated $690 million annually. Um, so when that proposition was created, teachers and supporters spent hours and hours out in the hot Arizona summer gathering petition signatures to get it on the ballot for, for this November. We needed 150,000 signatures, and we got 270,000 in two months, with mostly volunteer signature collectors. Um, however, in response to a lawsuit from the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, the, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that the 100-word summary, which was on each of the petition pages, was confusing, and they threw the initiative off of the ballot. So the 100-word summary was confusing, even though the full text of the initiative was stapled to every petition page. So let me return to the nonpartisanness of this issue. 270,000 Arizona voters wanted the chance to vote on the Invest in Education initiative. Whether you loved Invest in Ed or you hated it, they took away your chance to vote on it. They took away your voices. So, before we talk about why you should care about this election and education funding, let me tell you why I care. I had never been particularly politically active before this summer. Sure, I made my witty, outraged Facebook posts, but didn't we all? So why did I spend hours collecting signatures, and why do I now go knocking on doors every night after work? Because when I came out of grad school in 2010, the education cuts had started. And I saw that I couldn't make a living and pay back my student loans working in public education, even though secondary education was my background and that was my first love. I gathered petition signatures because it is not okay with me that Arizona is 49th in the nation in per pupil spending. Arizona students deserve so much more than that. And I knock on doors for voter turnout every night after work because I cannot stand it that only 18% of Arizona English language learners graduate from high school. That is the lowest rate in the nation. So let's talk about why you should care. Okay, raise your hands if you work in the public school system or charter schools, if you work at a university, if you work at a community college. Okay. So all of you are affected by the state budget. The state budget is approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. 
and it affects almost every aspect of our professional lives, from materials to salaries to maintenance to tuition rates, everything. So imagine if this budget was created by people who prioritized education. Okay, raise your hands again if you're affiliated with one of the state universities in some, some aspect. Okay, so the Board of Regents, which uh, governs all three universities, they are appointed by the governor. And they are responsible for setting tuition rates, choosing campus leadership, deciding how much that campus leadership gets paid, um, and making policy decisions like whether or not DREAMers can receive in-state tuition. Imagine if the Board of Regents was chosen by someone who prioritized education. And then finally, any, any public school teachers in here? Yeah, okay. So you know that part of the reason uh, our ELL graduation rate is so low is because of the state-mandated Structured English Immersion Program which is counter to second language acquisition theory and practice, was created by a California businessman and made into law by Arizona politicians. Imagine if ELL policy was created by people who prioritized education. These are political problems with a political solution. We have a chance this November to put people in the legislature and in the governor's office who prioritize education. So I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I will provide you with some resources to help you do some, some research on your own. So if you want to write these down or take a picture, um, I would recommend that. So the first is the Invest in Ed pledge. Um, at this address, you can find a list of candidates for state office who have signed this pledge. Uh, you can read the full text of the pledge. Uh, you can sign it yourself. And this is a nonpartisan effort. This pledge was sent out to all candidates for state office, and it was up to them to sign or not sign. The next resource is the Arizona <laughs> Education Association Fund for Public Education's endorsed propositions and candidates. There are some very important propositions on the ballot that could have a huge impact on public education. So I really recommend checking out this resource because there's a lot of propaganda and misleading information out there. So um, I recommend checking this out. These endorsements are also nonpartisan. They're based on candidates' uh, uh, statements and on their voting record if they're incumbents, as well as in-person interviews. And all candidates for state office were invited to participate in this process. And then finally, you can find your polling places and everything you need to know about voting on November 6th. So what do I want you to do? Number one, I want you to research pro-education candidates and propositions, get informed. I want you to tell five friends what you learned about these issues. The number one most effective way to help people learn about these very complicated issues and get them to commit to vote is face-to-face -face conversations. You don't have to go out and knock on doors. If you want to, you can. You can come with me. But face-to-face -face conversations with your friends are super effective. And then, of course, I want you to vote. So, in conclusion, most of us are educators because we care about our students and we care about our communities. We should also care about each other and this larger community of educators. And so I ask you to join me to stand together as a community and fight for a fully funded education system that works for all Arizona students, from early childhood education and kindergarten, all the way up to adult education programs, community colleges, and universities. So if you're feeling discouraged and overwhelmed and like this election doesn't matter, it does. If we stand together as a community and we make our voices heard at the ballot box on November 6th, we can create an education, uh, an education system that works for all of our students. <coughs> Thank you.